am named after two men whom I've never met. My grandfather, who died from a heart attack in his early 50s, and my uncle, who died in his early 20s, also from a heart attack. In fact, he was the reason I studied medicine. We live in an age where we don't need to be worried about infectious diseases. It's diseases of lifestyle that are killing us. 80% of heart attacks can be prevented by just living right. I reckon the hardest part about fighting heart disease is perception or misconception that it won't happen to me. I mean, I'm young, I'm bulletproof, I'm healthy. No one can say that. There's a wonderful proverb that says, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. So I choose to live. I think that's what matters most and that's why my heart is a priority to me. Heart disease is closer to us all than we think. I never would have imagined that it would happen in my family, but it did. Nobody wants to die young. I don't. The statistics are scary. 200 South Africans die from heart-related diseases every day. And I was 23 minutes away from becoming one of those statistics. So think about what's important to you. Think about your heart. Do you think about your heart? If not, do you know why you need to? Perhaps a lot of those that died suddenly from heart attacks and those lucky ones that survived didn't think of looking after their hearts. Alternatively, a lot of people who may know or may have heard about the importance of looking after one's heart simply don't. So what does it take to look after your heart? Well, stay tuned because this is what we're focusing on today, maintaining a healthy heart. We have experts who leave us with simple and practical tips on how to maintain our health of our hearts. Get yourself comfortable with pen and paper to jot down some of those important tips you just cannot afford to miss. Remember to interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk, and on Twitter at SABC Health Talk. I'm Dr. Salomon Dao, and this is Health Talk. Did you know you are most likely to die from heart diseases than with other chronic illnesses? According to the South African Medical Research Council, a global survey shows that 35 people died from lifestyle diseases in 2005. This is despite the fact that these diseases like hypertension, diabetes and heart diseases are preventable. All you have to do is exercise and eat healthy. But despite this, many people die from heart diseases in South Africa. Ignoring a heart attack or a symptom is not wise as it may lead to more complications and possibly death. When they do have chest pain or chest discomfort, feel short of breath, then it's best not to ignore, ignore it but to actually have it seen to, to, to intervene early um, and it can save lives. And of course in this day and age uh, people are very stressed, they work hard, there's very little time but one has to find time to de-stress and to be physically active. The electrocardiogram, also known as the ECG, is a diagnostic tool used to assess the electrical and muscular and functions of the heart. And that's the valve in the While heart. it is a relatively simple test to perform, okay, so it can assist in there. detecting problems and also monitor your heart. Which is the ECG, which is the electrocardiogram, to measure the electrics of the heart. One of the other things is to actually look at the heart, which is what we do with this, with this machine. You see the little white line there that moves up and down? And that's the valve in the heart. Okay, so there's there are two there. So we can move this probe around and look at different parts of the heart. And we can see the size, depending on what we want to measure. And we want to see that the, the heart and the chambers are all normal size and working properly. A heart attack can be frightening for the person having it, but preventable with simple lifestyle changes. Right, now, did you know that whilst you relaxed watching this program, at the top of the hour, your heart will have beaten over 4,300 times, pushing through over 300 litres of blood. Yes, 300 litres of blood, all of that just in one hour. That's how much this vital organ keeps us alive. But when it starts malfunctioning or stops suddenly, consequences may be disastrous. So what can go wrong with the heart? Well, let's understand this from our special guest, Dr. Riaz Mutara, who is a cardiologist in practice in Johannesburg. Riaz, welcome to Health Talk. Good morning, Salo. Thank you for having me on your show. Right. So before we start talking about heart attacks and stuff, you know, let's just go down to basics. Let's just perhaps ask you to explain what the <coughs> role of the heart is in our bodies. What, why do we need the heart? Mm -hmm. So there's two ways of looking at it, uh, Salo. Firstly, the heart structurally is a pump. 
Uh, it's designed to pump blood around the body to carry uh, blood that's rich in oxygen and nutrients to all the cells of the body. But it also receives old blood, so to speak, uh, and to renew that blood with oxygen and nutrients and pump that around the body. Right. But the heart is also the seat of emotion, mm -hmm. and uh, it's where we fall in love and we feel that pain. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> because everything is related to the heart. You know, you feel you have a fantastic meal, you feel very well, mm -hmm. you've eaten to your heart's content. True. You fall in love, yeah. it's, there's, there's reference made to the heart. Yes. But what role does it play in our emotion? So when we experience emotional events in our life, so when we feel sad or you feel elated or you feel happy, you feel that joy in the center of your chest. It's the similar type of effect when you say, I've got a gut feeling and you feel it in your tummy mm -hmm. for that sake. Right. Uh, and nobody can really show you where is that place in your heart that you really feel that sense of emotion. Right. And I think that goes back to who we really are mm -hmm. as human beings. Oh, interesting. Okay, now <coughs> getting back to the heart now. You, you've just said that obviously it pumps all of this uh, blood to take nutrients and oxygen to all parts of the body that we need. But what, how does itself, you know, uh, what does it need to function on its own? All right, so the heart itself is made up of different structures, like any other organ within the body. So it's got, it's essentially a muscle, mm -hmm. Uh, it's got nerves, it's got valves, it's got arteries and veins. So the heart itself needs blood and oxygen to survive. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. So let's go then into what is it that can go wrong with the heart and where does it happen? What sort of conditions do we know that affect the heart? You know, Salo, there are so many things that can go wrong with the heart. And Perhaps maybe an easy way to understand all the different conditions that can affect the heart is to look at it anatomically or to look at the structure of the heart. Mm -hmm. So there are specific diseases of the muscle, there are specific diseases of the valves, there are specific diseases that affect the nerves, which then determines the way our heart beat will, or our heart beats, whether it's going to be regular or irregular. Uh, there's uh, conditions that may affect the sac in which the heart pumps. Mm -hmm. So there are so many diseases that can affect the heart, and different conditions will may affect people at different points in their life. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, we, we, we tend to talk about the heart, and then there's <coughs> talk of the cardiovascular system. Just explain that for us. Right. So the heart is part of the cardiovascular system. Right. The cardiovascular system would be made up of the heart itself, but all the arteries on the outside of the heart, all the veins that return blood, to the heart as well as the lungs mm -hmm. okay that form part of that circulation right. process okay so so when you talk of cardiovascular disease you, you then are talking about a disease state that affects the heart and these vessels correct okay now let's talk about specific conditions that are common specific right. cardiovascular conditions that are affecting our nation so by far the commonest condition that affects us is one of high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, an interesting study was published last year by the World Health Organization that shows that South Africans have the highest rate of high blood pressure in the world. Worrying, so, isn't that so? Yeah, it's really worrying. 78% yeah. of people over the age of 50 in our country mm. suffer from some form of high blood pressure. Mm, 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 so uh, the condition of high blood pressure is exceptionally common in our country and is only growing and growing over time. Is it more common in <coughs> males, females? It tends to be common across the board right. and there are many reasons for why we have such high levels of high blood pressure. There may be genetic reasons for this happening but it may be also related to the fact that we are getting fatter. Mm. So our, we, have, yeah. we are a nation that's uh, getting more obese. Yeah. We're going to come back to uh, yeah. causes and risk factors sure. but because that, that's obviously a very important <coughs> one that we shouldn't, we shouldn't leave. Um, all right. The, I mean, there's high blood pressure on the one end. Right. What about in the heart itself? We hear of heart attacks. What is a heart attack? All that a heart attack is, is a sudden disruption or a blockage of blood flow to the muscle of the heart itself. So you may have narrowings in your arteries that may have developed over time as a consequence of cholesterol depositing in your arteries mm. 
or you may have a tear in your artery if your blood pressure is very high and that suddenly blocks one of the arteries to a particular part of the heart. Mm. And when the muscle doesn't get enough blood supply, that muscle dies. And that's what we call a heart attack. So it's similar in a way to a stroke, isn't it? It's exactly the same thing. Right. It's just different organs. So one's the brain and yeah. the other is the heart. All right. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and what are the common signs and symptoms of a heart attack? So it depends largely if you are male or female. Right. So most men would have the classical symptoms of chest pain or a tightness or a heaviness in the center of your chest. It feels like an elephant is sitting on your chest. Mm. That discomfort, it's not really a pain like we understand pain where you're being cut by a knife or stung by a bee. It's more a tightness or a heaviness or a constriction that you experience right in the center of your chest. Mm -hmm. And that discomfort may then radiate up into your jaw and down into your left arm. Mm. You may feel lightheaded or faint or dizzy. Uh, you may be aware of your heart beating. That's what we call palpitations. Okay? Mm. Or you may collapse yeah. with a heart attack. And, and, and this, is, this is not being overcome by emotion or anything like that, isn't that so? No. Okay, right. trust me, when you are having a heart attack, you'll yeah. know that you are having a heart attack. Right. It's completely different to anything else that you may have experienced before. Right. Whereas women, yeah. on the other hand, present completely uh, differently. Interesting. How? How so? Okay, so most women don't have the classical symptoms of chest pain or discomfort in the center of the chest. They may feel it in the upper abdomen, they may experience pain in their shoulders, they may complain of feeling nauseous, uh, they may complain of feeling lightheaded and feeling anxious, having an anxiety type of feeling which makes it difficult sometimes to often then make the diagnosis and I feel or I think that sometimes may be the reason why many women get missed by mm. doctors in the first place. Sure. Earlier in my introduction I said the consequences of a heart attack may actually be quite disastrous. How many people <coughs> die from heart attacks and how many survive? Right, so 70% of people who have a heart attack actually don't survive the heart attack. That's I mean, that's a phenomenal figure that in today's times, 70% of people who have a heart attack will die from a heart attack. Hmm. Of the 30% of people who do survive their heart attack and end up at hospital, then more than 90% of those patients will survive their heart attack. Mm. So the message is just don't have a heart attack. All right, let's leave it on this note because we just need to go for a quick commercial break. Please stay with us because after the break, we now discuss causes and risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Stay tuned. news. Clientel is giving more back to our clients. In fact, we are giving it all back. Yes, all your premiums, every single cent you ever paid on top of your payout amount, in cash, tax-free. This is a South African first. Plans start from only 120 rand per month. The Clientel Ultimate Dignity Plan. The only funeral plan that pays you everything back. SMS Ultimate to 47025 and we'll call you back. Morning Live sets the agenda for the day. We bring you the latest local and international news. We are on the ball with all your sports activities and results. We give you the latest business update. We bring you the latest weather every time. Watch Morning Live every weekday morning at 6 o'clock, bringing you everything you need to know before you go. Shab Shab, eight ten I. We kick off this week's show by seeing how Kenyans are paying tribute to the victims as well as not only how they've coped but how they return stronger after the attacks. Last year, images of the four-day Westgate Mall attack 
saturated front pages. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, artists have assembled to celebrate the peace this war-torn country has not had in a long time. No conflict that can't be solved without a conversation. The Journal, every Saturday at half past one on SABC News. Technology is all around us and is improving lives across Africa, like how young Nigerians are connecting to the internet. There are doctors finding new ways to save lives in Cameroon, and the South African public transport system that is now getting Wi-Fi. We have gadgets, apps and loads more, some of which play a big role in Africa's growth. A huge part of this African growth is technological innovation. To find out a bit more about social media and technology news from here in Africa and abroad, join me as Pumele Lezondi every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. on SABC News. SABC brings to you Rugby World Cup 2015. Let's do this. Welcome back to Health Talk. Now, there are many risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease. A few of them are said to be non-modifiable, which sadly means that you can't do anything about them. The good news, though, is that a lot of these risk factors are controllable through simple lifestyle changes. Let's explore this a little further with our guests. We still have Dr. Riaz Motara, cardiologist in practice in Johannesburg. And we have uh, Greta Gannett, a biokineticist also in practice in Johannesburg. And in our Cape Town studio, we have Gabriel Extian, who is a nutritionist or dietitian with the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Welcome to Health Talk, uh, Gabriel. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. All right. And uh, we'll, we'll get back to you now. And welcome to Health Talk, uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Greta. Dr. All right. Perhaps let's start with you, uh, Arias. Um, in terms of risk factors, we, we said that there are those that are non-modifiable that you can't do anything about. Mm -hmm. Let's start talking about those. Okay. So there are... Some of the risk factors or the main reason I believe of why we get heart disease in the first place is that there's a genetic basis to heart disease. Mm -hmm. So either there's a very strong family history uh, of heart disease or uh, there are certain factors in our environment that have changed our genes in a way that make us more likely to get heart disease. Mm. Um, and then you have all the other modifiable risk factors or lifestyle factors that contribute or yeah. accelerate uh, the risk of developing heart disease. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> so we often hear this notion of, you know, not choosing your parents carefully. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what exactly in the family then puts you at risk? Right. So there are specific genetic factors that may give uh, us a higher risk of developing high blood pressure. Mm. There may be specific factors that uh, give us a risk of developing diseases that are specific to the heart muscle. Mm -hmm. uh, there are factors that may contribute to us, towards us getting higher cholesterol levels mm -hmm. uh, uh, from a genetic perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other factors that may give us uh, a higher risk of developing higher homocysteine levels, for example, that increase our risk of developing heart disease or heart attacks and strokes. All right. So, so if, if I'm watching this program and, and I do know that my father <coughs> once was told that mm. he's got some sort of a heart condition right. and my mother has high blood pressure, do I take that as you know, being at risk of developing a heart attack? Yes. So your risk, if you have both parents at risk or who have suffered with heart disease, so there are certain diseases or heart disease that have a stronger genetic risk mm -hmm. than other diseases. But if you had a dad or an uncle uh, or an older brother who has suffered a heart attack at a young age, then you may be at a significantly higher risk of having the same genetic abnormality that may then result in a specific chemical abnormality in your blood mm. that may increase your risk of developing heart disease. Okay, very quickly before I leave you, mm. is age and ethnicity necessarily a risk factor? Uh, not anymore, I believe. You know, I mean, in the past, age above 55 used to be a risk factor for a heart attack. Then it was over 50 and 45, and it's now age over 35. Mm -hmm. So my youngest patient with a heart attack is 16 years old. Mm. So more and more younger people these days are suffering from heart attacks and strokes 
and heart disease and high blood pressure. And we can come to the reasons of why that's happening okay. later in the show. Greta, let's talk about some lifestyle risk factors now. A lot of us are sedentary. In other words, we just sit on our couches, watch television the whole time and, you know, snack on yeah. uh, chips and, and, and so <laughs> on. Tell us about some well, of those. Well, I think that is the biggest problem and uh, that's why I think the age has become um, a lower um, age where you can get heart attacks. Right. Because nowadays kids don't play outside anymore. For them, it's better to play PlayStation or sit with their iPhones, um, mm. they're not active anymore. It's important and to talk about kids because some of these behaviors start quite early and, yes. and once they get into adulthood, it's very difficult to change, isn't that so? Yes, yes. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's starting at a young age and then also the parents don't show any example mm. for the kids to be more active, yeah. to use a flight of stairs instead of the escalator. Yeah. Um, so I think small changes... Yeah can make a difference um, yeah. and people right. don't realize how important activity is yeah. and yeah. Okay. What about other li <laughs> lifestyle factors? Well, definitely food <coughs> and diet is very important. Yeah. Um, maybe, so maybe on that note, let's just invite Gabriel from our studios in Cape Town. Gabriel, just tell us a little bit about, you know, other lifestyle factors that are risk factors for cardiovascular disease, particularly around the food that we eat, because that's a huge problem, isn't it, so? Yes, I think that's one of the big problems we're facing, and our civilization we have to accept is changing. We're living in a, a modern society, and we are uh, living in a convenient society, which means on the one side our exercise is changing, which we've already mentioned. Also in the way that we work, the way that we commute, all those things are changing. We're becoming less sedentary, or more sedentary at least, and less active. But then looking at what we're eating, it's also driven by our convenience uh, we're eating more uh, processed foods, more easy foods, moving away from fresh vegetables, fruits, the things that we probably know that we should be eating. Uh, also a lot of salt intake, which is one of the big reasons we're seeing blood pressure. And just to touch quickly on that, mm. when we're talking about our modifiable factors, one of the things that's really modifiable as well, which we often don't talk about, is our own ability to look into our lives and know whether we are at risk of heart disease. Mm. And that's what we're really trying to do as a heart foundation is make people aware of these risk factors. So people are often aware what are these things but they don't look at it how does it affect my own life and something like blood pressure one in three adults in South Africa are living with high blood pressure but most of us don't know about it which means we're not looking at what can we do to change what can we do with our diet with our exercise or even treatment to try and prove that mm -hmm. what about smoking though we you know because that that I believe is one of the biggest risk factors and that's all Yes, I think smoking is, if we look at what the WHO tells us, we see that hypertension is on the top of the list of risk factors. Uh, after that, smoking is right up there, as well as uh, very high cholesterol levels, often genetically driven. Uh, and only after that do we see diabetes, uh, overweight, uh, not exercising enough, and healthy diet following. So those are uh, roughly in order the things that is affecting our lifestyle. So we think of smoking, we think of lung cancer. That's the first thing that pops into our mind. Uh, but it actually doubles our risk of heart, heart disease. And triples our risk of stroke. So it's definitely one of the main risk factors. Uh, and if you are smoking, probably one of the easiest things you can change to reduce your risk. Mm. I want to come back to you and ask you if whether or not there is anything called a heart healthy meal. But is there anything such as a meal that is not healthy for your heart? When we're looking at food, uh, food is obviously a very complex issue. Uh, it's also a very emotional issue. Uh, it depends on the affordability of food, the accessibility of food. But yes, we can look at our food and say there are healthier foods and there are less healthy foods. Does that mean that we should never eat those unhealthy foods? No. So we're looking at very salty foods, uh, foods that has been fried or deep fried with trans fats, saturated fats. Those things are not heart healthy. Uh, but it's the frequency and the amount of these foods that we eat yeah. that really become a problem. Right. Uh, and it works in two or three ways. It affects our blood pressure, it affects our weight, uh, and it can affect our cholesterol levels. Right. And those just, are the three things just, that can then lead to heart disease. Yeah, just hold your thought there because I want us to continue on that. So just how can we deal with these modifiable risk factors for heart attacks? That and more after the break. Please stay with us.
people, we are getting there. And thanks to you, Pati is set to become our country's 12th official language. <laughs> Here's today's word. Substitute. Replacing a drinking body with somebody more fun. Ah. Ah. That's more like it. Help make party South Africa's 12th official language. Sign the petition today. I've got a credit card. Cut! Boy! Get behind Rugby World Cup 2015 on SABC. This is Rights and Recourse. This act says we are all the same, we are all equal before the law. I have a fundamental problem with her saying that traditional leaders are recognised as the de facto owners of the land. Uh, that isn't in the Constitution, nor is it in any law. Unpacking your legal rights and cost of action. The Constitution starts from the point that we are one country and that we, want, we need to have a system that actually consolidates that, but also recognizes the different compositions of different communities. With due respect to Aninka, I know she is happy that the queen in England. She's the owner of the whole land. She's not having any authority. Chief Mugwena, we, 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 we will we will get to some must, of the other you issues. You must throw that 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 uh, Linka's, um, Queen of England. Please, that's that's completely unacceptable. That's rights and recourse Sundays at 2 p.m. on the SABC News Channel. food low salted but well flavored so health use, uh, it's easy to dismiss it as something to work on when you get the time that is until your heart fails you miss vicky munyamane a dietitian practicing at louis pasture hospital explained the benefits of eating healthy you're looking at the lifespan that people have for me uh, look people would have many things that they would benefit from eating healthy from having a disease-free uh, life then you don't want to wake up and find yourself in hospital for many weeks simply because you've not been eating healthy. Uh, you want to be energetic, you want to do your business without having to worry about collapsing out of nowhere. And for young people, you're looking at having a long lifespan that is actually disease free. There are other benefits like looking good, having a good skin, good hair, you know, things of that sort. But more so I would say for a young person going about life, you want that vitality and that energy out of life. So eating healthy carries its beautiful packs. You can do an enormous amount of benefits by paying attention to staying healthy and avoid diseases like heart disease and stroke. When you're looking at heart healthy meals, you're thinking someone who is not necessarily having a heart condition, but just you and I trying to live a healthy lifestyle. So. Basically what you're looking at, you're looking at the nature of the oils that you use. For your heart-friendly meals, most of the time what we're looking at is that when you choose your oils, when you're doing your groceries, look for plant oils because they don't actually clot your arteries. They're very friendly for your heart. So in that case, your cooking oils will range from sunflower to canola to your olive oils to your avocado oils, your linseed oils. Now, these oils serve a different purposes. Some of them will work for the salads, others would work for cooking. Like your linseed oil and olive oil will still do your salads very well. Your canola or your canola leaf will do your cooking very well. So those would be a range of your heart-friendly oils. And you could also be looking at heart-friendly food, like for instance, your fresh avocado. It's very perfect, protects your heart, you're looking at other oily foods like your tuna oils, your, let's say your fish in oils, they'll be very heart friendly and those are some of the things you actually want to add 
in your groceries, including your seeds. You know those nuts and seeds that people pass by when they do shopping, like what is this? Those nuts and seeds, very heart friendly, can include them for your snacks as well. She also advised on what to add when you do your groceries. The one thing that I would want to urge uh, people to do is when you do, when you do your groceries, almost always pay attention to what your plate would have at the end of the day. Uh, from the meat items that you buy to the vegetables and fruits for the week. So when you go shopping, don't just get excited by all the lights and find that you took all the sweeties and all the refined foods. And when you get home, you want to cook a healthy meal. There is nothing on your grocery list. So you may want to consider the vegetables, fruits that you're going to use for the week. You want to consider the choices of meat that you're going to have. If you're going to want to have fish twice a week or chicken or, you know, those kind of things. Just pay attention to what, at the end of the day, your plates and your lunch boxes would, you would want to have. Choosing healthy food stuff does not necessarily have to burn a hole in your pocket. Choose fruit that are in season. Have cereal, seed, bread and fruits for breakfast. For lunch, choose from pilchards, chicken and salad. Try to avoid too much red meat, burgers, pizzas and starch. When it comes to flavoring food, if I'm thinking a heart friendly meal, I'm thinking keeping the meal low in terms of salt. So then you're looking at other things that you can use to flavor your food without having that salt burden. So at the most, what I like to use is my black pepper. So I'll use the black pepper cones. I always keep a mortar and grinder. So as you can see, we grind so many things. So in the grind, I'll mix a whole lot of different herbs to create a flavor without having to use excess amount of salt. So in here I would grind anything, depending on what flavors I want to bring, I would grind my garlic, my fresh chives, my black pepper, I'll grind them together to create a flavor and then put a little pinch of oil and that's what will go to flavoring the, the food. Stick to these golden rules and you'll go a long way of living a healthy lifestyle. Welcome back to Heart Talk. We're talking matters of the heart. Our hearts thrive on a healthy lifestyle, simply. Now, the healthier the lifestyle, the longer we live. But what in simple terms constitutes a healthy lifestyle? Well, our guests will enlighten us. We still have Dr. Riaz Matara, cardiologist in practice in Johannesburg, Greta Gannett, biokineticist in practice in Johannesburg, and from our Cape Town studio, Gabriel Axtian, who is a nutritionist with the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Let's start with you, uh, uh, Riaz. Before we talk about lifestyle, we often advise people to, you know, have regular checks and know their numbers. What actually sure. do you mean by that? So, it depends on your age group again, Salah. If you're young, you should be having an assessment or below the age of 40, maybe every five years if you are generally healthy. Mm -hmm. But over the age of uh, 40, you may want to have your heart checked every two years. And as we get older, or if we have specific medical conditions, you may want to have an annual check. Now, you want your heart rate generally between the range of 60 to 80 uh, to be in good health. Yeah. Um, you want your blood pressure uh, less than 130 over 85. Those are the uh, magical figures. And for me, your weight um, is a difficult one. I prefer to look at it in terms of your body percentage fat rather than your total weight because it can right. be confusing. Mm -hmm. You could be a bodybuilder and be very muscular but have no fat. Yeah. Or the other way around. Or you could be short for that matter. Or you could be short for that matter. Yeah. That's true. So yeah. um, if you aim for a body percentage fat, and maybe uh, Greta will can, can help me on this, of around 18 to 20 percent, mm. then that would be your optimal weight for your height. Yeah. And but maybe maybe yeah. let's, let's just get Greta to comment on this because yeah. there's, all, there's this notion of waist circumference. Mm with respect to you know, heart disease being a lot more important mm. than BMI generally. Waist circumference, what should we, how, pe how should people know what's normal? Well, your waist circumference is, once again, it's just an indication, but it's not the norm to say, okay, you mm. are gonna have a heart attack. Right. It's just a guide to say, okay, maybe the, you are at risk because your waist circumference is a bit high. Yeah. Um, but what it we know is normal, so, so what should men's waist circumference be to be comfortable? Well, there's different formulas in different um, associations, but I think they work on the range of 102, I think um, yeah, you me. can correct me on that one. 
Um, so we work in that range. Um, so it might be that, one or two men, centimetre eh? lower, up or <coughs> lower for women. For women. Um, but but Riz, just, just about mm. that, I mean, intra-abdominal fat uh, as, as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Mm. Your, your comment on that? You know, for me, the, when you look at weight gain or if you look at obesity, um, that gives you a higher risk of specific cholesterol abnormalities. It pushes up your blood pressure. Um, it increases your clotting profile. It gives you a higher risk of developing diseases like diabetes. So the heart disease is as a consequence of all the complications from being overweight. Mm. And for me, although, uh, you know, people need to understand the concept of low-fat or fat-free. Mm. If you eat a meal that's low-fat or fat-free, and perhaps Gabriel can mm. confirm this, it has to be high in something else, and it's usually high in refined sugar. Yeah. And many people don't know or understand that our bodies are quite unique in that they have the capability of converting sugar into fat. Mm. So although we are eating lower fat meals and healthier fat meals, okay, we're eating far too much refined or processed sugar and our body is able to convert that into fat, which then gives us all these risks of developing heart disease. Well, let's invite a comment from Gabriel then. Gabriel, sugar is killing a lot of us in South Africa. Your comment. Yes, I think you're right. It's not just sugar as such, because uh, when we look at uh, sugar from a um, nutritional level, there's not much difference between sugar and refined carbohydrate. Uh, but we also obviously find healthy sugars and things like fruits, even some vegetables have got sugar in. So what we're looking at really is uh, an energy equation. Our body is a machine and it uses fuel. Uh, and if we start putting in too much fuel into this machine that we're not using, that gives us weight gain. It, and then particularly weight gain, as we said, around your abdominal area uh, is what then causes diabetes, metabolic syndrome, uh, problems with your cholesterol levels, as well as your um, blood sugar levels. So we should be looking at offsetting this energy equation. Unfortunately, with our convenience lifestyle, we are taking in more refined carbohydrates. We are taking in more sugars. Uh, in some communities, we are, we are taking in more fatty substances as well. Yeah. Um, but whatever your body's not using, whether it's fats, whether it's carbohydrates, whether it's protein, your body will process it and it will turn it into fat to store. And that causes these metabolic abnormalities, which leads to weight gain and the rest. Can we have a few practical examples? <clears throat> For instance, I mean, when you talk about you know, refined sugars, um, you know, fatty substance. What, what are those common foodstuffs? I mean, without mentioning, you know, these uh, chains, uh, but, but at least common foodstuffs that we can talk about. Yes, so of course. The first thing that I would like to mention is where we look at types of foods, but we also look at volume of food. So no matter if you're eating, uh, if we're talking about fatty foods, we're talking about carbohydrates, uh, if you're eating too much in general, your body will have an excess and it will start storing. And that could be bread, it could be oils, uh, it could be protein foods. But when we're looking at particular foodstuffs, uh, when we look at starchy foods, those are great energy foods. So we're talking bread, we're talking maize meal, we're talking rice. When we're eating too much of it, our body will convert it into fat. Uh, what we want to try and do is limit those foods to a good portion size, which for most people is around, uh, roughly around a fist size portion on your plate for supper, but also look at the quality of that item. The less processed it is, the more fiber is in there, the more vitamins, the more minerals are in there, the more it keeps your energy levels constant. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe another way of putting it is the, the food that's freshly pre prepared at home it's probably a lot healthier than that which, you know, is processed that you buy from the supermarket. I think once we, we have to look at processing in two ways. Processing is not always a bad thing. Uh, processing makes our lives more convenient uh, and helps us to live a, a modern life. But we also look need to look at what does processing do to food. And often it adds additional salt, it adds additional fats, or even additional sugars into foods, which makes it more energy dense, and we don't often realize that. If we use an example of sugary drinks like sodas, uh, those things, we don't realize we're taking in all this extra energy. It doesn't necessarily give us the satiring effect, which makes it doesn't mean uh, make us feel full, uh, but yet it gives us energy, which offsets our balance and causes weight gain. Okay, Greta, we, you know, we, we, we're running out of time in this segment, but I'd, I'd like us to talk about exercise now as a way you know, of keeping healthy, uh, both for those that 
don't have any form of disease and those that already have some form of established disease. But I'd like you to think about it because after the break, I'd, I'd, I'd invite some comment from you, all right? All right, so what is secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease? Well, that and more after the break. Please stay with us. spoken to the president about resigning. We ask hard questions. What you're trying to do requires a lot of money and you don't have money. We ask quick questions. A quick one. You are aware that the PAC has now been banned by the IEC? I'm aware. And you are also aware that it has been banned because of you? We ask good questions. Are you an infiltrated organization? We also ask funny questions. Is it safe to eat your chicken? All the questions, all the time, right here on Question Time, Monday to Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Media Monitor, the title says it all. Can we really afford more job losses at such a critical time in our economy? Join our panel of experts as they unpack and monitor all the leading and breaking news stories making waves in the print and social media platforms. It seems we don't have a famous son-in-law any longer. Levi, what do you say to this? <laughs> An well, A-lister. I'll, I'll leave this one to Levi. He's the romantic. <laughs> Watch Media Monitor with me, Alicia Jali, Sundays at 9 a.m. only on the SABC News Channel. Welcome to Network, a technology news program that also discusses what's trending in social media in and around Africa. MTN has launched its new movie and television streaming service, Front Row. If it's trending, we will find it. That's Network with me, Spumela Lezondi, every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. only on the SABC News Channel. SABC brings to you Rugby World Cup 2015. Let's do this. Recovering from a heart attack can be a long process. It also requires you to make big changes in your life. Taking medication, eating healthy meals and physical exercise become a priority. There's a, there's a number of aspects. One is obviously medical treatment, where one is given medication to try and improve the, the general condition of the heart. From a cardiac rehab point of view, the treatment involves lifestyle modification. So it's to improve lifestyle in terms of if one is a smoker, for example, to stop smoking, because that improves health. If one drinks too much, to reduce that. If the eating habits are not healthy, to try and improve cholesterol and other aspects of, of cardiac disease. And very importantly is the exercise. That's the, the main aspect of cardiac rehabilitation, where one can improve not just the heart, but the general functioning of the whole body. If you have been diagnosed with heart disease or you have had a heart attack, you will benefit from participating in a structured cardiac rehabilitation program. At the Witz Cardiac Rehabilitation Center located at Witz Education Campus in Johannesburg, Alan Stricker had heart complications after going through a knee surgery and his weight was also contributing to his health as he weighs 180 kilos. End of March, I kept on saying to my wife, I feel like I'm having a heart attack. And then they rushed me back to hospital and they found out that I had blood clots in my, going through my system. And the blood clots are the bottom of my lungs and the right hand side of my heart. I couldn't walk far. I couldn't walk up a flight of stairs 
And then my doctor, house doctor changed my doctors that had been looking after me and he got new doctors. And the medical aide could see that there was no improvement and they sent me here to Witz uh, Cardia. I've lost about 40, 40 something kilos. I'm improving now all the time. My weight's coming down and uh, Witz Cardia, they look after me. The Cardiac Rehabilitation Center at the Witz University runs a rehab program for heart disease patients. The program can improve your heart's ability to function, lower your heart's rate, and reduce your risk of dying or developing complications from heart diseases in the future. Intervention for people who have heart disease or have had a cardiac event like a heart attack or a um, angina or even a heart transplant um, where one tries to improve the health and reverse the condition as much as possible. It's also a program that intervenes with patients who are at risk for having a heart disease um, to try and minimize that risk. Welcome back to Health Talk. We still continue our discussion on matters of the heart, staying healthy. And in this time around, we're going to talk about secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Perhaps let me ask you to explain, because I put the question out there, right. secondary prevention. What is that? So, so secondary prevention of heart disease refers to the treatment approach or the approach once you've actually had a heart attack or had a stroke or had an event uh, in your life. So um, we would treat you differently compared to if you didn't have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So once you've had a heart attack or a stroke or an event in your life, then the approach tends to be more aggressive in terms of particular types of medication. So we would then want to drop your cholesterol to lower levels. Mm -hmm. You may need to be on specific blood thinners to prevent a subsequent uh, stroke. Mm -hmm. And the approach to uh, your exercise after an event versus before an event mm -hmm. will also be different. Okay, let's talk a little bit about blood thinners mm -hmm. because you know there's this issue and I, I also want to invite the comment on you on the statins. Right. Okay? In those that are deemed to be high risk, mm -hmm. who should be on blood thinners? All right, so there's a lot of confusion around this. I mean, people yeah. would say that, you know, you need to take an aspirin for life. Yeah. And I believe the aspirin doesn't prevent the heart attack by thinning your blood. Mm. I think the aspirin prevents the heart attack because it's an anti-inflammatory. It reduces inflammation in our arteries, mm. which causes the problem with our cholesterol to stick to our arteries. Mm. So I think there's a dual action for aspirin in, in patients who haven't had a heart attack. But once you've actually had the heart attack, uh, and you may have had a blockage in your artery and your cardiologist may have unblocked your artery by putting in a stent, then you are going to require blood thinners. But there's also, you know, the converse side of that where these blood thinners may increase your risk of other problems. Yeah, now this, so, is, this is confusing now. Isn't yes, it? So, they may increase your risk of an ulcer or they may increase your risk of bleeding. So you need to be aware of the risks mm -hmm. associated with being on blood thinners. So, so what should people out there do? Rather consult with the doctor, take advice from the doctor as to whether or not you need to be on, on this blood thinner. For sure. So right. any, any blood thinner or any medication that you're going to take, your doctor has to give you advice in terms of the risks yeah. versus the benefits of being on them. All right. Then okay. clear this confusion around statins. Who should be on a statin? So firstly, statins are a class of drug that we use to treat cholesterol. Personally, as a cardiologist, I feel patients are being over-treated in our country right. because their risk is not being adequately calculated. Mm -hmm. So if you fall into a low-risk category of developing, developing heart disease, you're a non-smoker, you're not overweight, you're exercising, and your cholesterol is slightly elevated, then perhaps that patient doesn't qualify, according to the guidelines, to be on these drugs mm -hmm. because they may also have side effects over a long period of time and you're committing patients to taking medication for life. However, once you've actually had an event or if you fall into a high risk group, if you are diabetic, for example, if you have an exceptionally strong family history, if your good cholesterol is low and your bad cholesterol is very high, mm. then perhaps starting at a low dose 
of a statin and building it up to try and achieve the targets that you want to achieve, then you know, that may be indicated. But it's interesting that even patients who are on cholesterol medication still have heart attacks and still have strokes and the disease still progresses. So, if so it's a false sense of security. It's a it? false sense of security because you have to look at your risk holistically today yeah. and look at all the risk factors rather than looking at one, one particular risk factor. All right. Krista, let's just talk a little bit about exercise. You know, I, I did say it before the break that I'll invite you to just chat to us about what form of exercise should, you know, normal people out there be doing uh, before. I mean, in other words, those that, as a form of primary prevention, those yeah. that, you know, haven't got any established cardiovascular disease. Well, obviously, cardiovascular exercise is your number one um, exercise to do and to incorporate in your life because that's the exercise that keeps the heart healthy. Mm -hmm. um, five times a week, up to seven times a week is the ideal um, to do at least 30 minutes a day of a little brisk walk every day to keep the heart healthy. Um, if you can do a little bit more intense cardiovascular exercise, even better because your yeah. heart is forced to work even harder. Let's come up with other, you know, simple examples of cardiovascular exercise. You mentioned brisk walking. What other stuff can people do? So, you know, people tend to associate exercise with going to the gym, no. which, you know, has a cost associated yes, with that. Yes. So what simple things can people do to just stay active? You can take a step inside your home and start doing step climbing. So you can go up and down a step for, say, two minutes, rest a minute, um, that kind of stuff, um, just to elevate the heart rate a little bit. You can go for a swim. Um, you can go for a jog, obviously the same as um, a brisk walk. Yeah. And then you can go for a cycle, anything that gets the heart pumping faster. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, let me just go across to Cape Town and invite a comment from uh, Gabriel. Gabriel, perhaps your last word around, I mean, we've spoken a lot about nutrition now. What, what sort of a general advice do you as the Heart and Stroke Foundation give, um, you know, in, 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 in secondary prevention? And because this is really what we're talking about, yeah? Yes, yeah, secondary prevention and primary prevention, really, if we look at the type of lifestyle factors that we should incorporate, should almost be very similar. Uh, and often after a heart attack, we should be doing the things we should have done 20 years ago. So in a way, the eating habits is still very, very similar. We should still be looking at eating enough fruit and vegetables, which is something that is lacking in most South Africans' lives. Uh, on average, South Africans eat two to three portions of fruit and vegetables a day, and we'd like to see that go up to about five or six. And obviously, there's many factors that influence that. We need to look at whether you've had a heart attack or not, uh, look at the amount of especially starchy foods you have in excess, um, as well as the type of fats. And very important that we focus on a lot is how much salt you're having. The average South African eats about twice as much salt as we should, uh, not only from the salt we put in our food, but also the salt that's already on, um, in the food when we buy it. Mm -hmm. So it's about choosing your foods you buy uh, carefully, but more importantly, when you're cooking at home, when you're sitting at the table, uh, reducing the amount of salt in your cooking so that we can uh, get an effect on our blood pressure levels, whether right. it's primary or secondary pre prevention. Okay. Just lastly, we have about a minute left. Yeah. In terms of monitoring blood pressure, I mean, this is one very important mm. thing now in terms of, uh, you know, preventing heart attacks and strokes mm. and so on. Please just take us through that. All right. So all the hypertension societies in the world today are, <coughs> excuse me, recommending home monitoring of blood pressure. Right. And what home monitoring of blood pressure is, is in exactly the same way if you are diabetic and you would test your sugar before and after a meal to know what your sugar levels are. Yeah. Um, these societies are now... Uh, encouraging people to check their blood pressure on a minimum of three times a week. Right. Uh, and um, but the, all, all these devices that are you know right. bundled around, and some of them mm. are sold at, at supermarkets and you know, right. uh, pharmacies and so on. What's the safest and, and, and more so practical way, and, and perhaps more accurate way of doing this? Right. So you you know it becomes expensive to pop into your doctor every day or three times a week to check your blood pressure or yeah. to your pharmacy. Most people don't have the time to do that. Yeah. Uh, there are more modern devices yeah. that are um, you know, validated devices yeah. and, and, and very well calibrated yeah. that you can test your blood pressure using your mobile phone today and you can do that anywhere yeah. in the world. It's a pity we don't have time. Yeah. Uh, we've run out of time <laughs> okay. uh, today. But yeah, Dr. Riaz Motara, cardiologist in Johannesburg, 
Um, Greta Gannett back, an ethicist also in Johannesburg and from our Cape Town studio. Uh, Gabriel Exton, a nutritionist from the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Sir. All right, it's on that note that we come to the end of our show today, folks. Uh, join us again next week on SABC News. A reminder to please share your views and comments with us via our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk, and follow us on Twitter, Twitter at SABC Health Talk. And remember, you can watch repeat of these shows 2 p.m. and 10 p.m. tonight, or simply just go to the SABC YouTube link to get any of the past shows that we've had. I'm Dr. Salomon Dogan. and thank you so much for watching, and please take care of those hearts. Stay careful.